Father, once again, we stand before you as a group and, and uh, we ask for your guidance as together we examine your word. We know that you have very specific intent, that you have a very clear message that you intend to communicate to us and we want to understand your message, not ours. So we ask that you do that for us this morning. In your name, amen. Well, we, uh, we're, we're moving into a new, a new, I call a new phase of, of Christ's ministry uh, in, in his life here on earth. And, and he is starting to, um, he's, he's starting to do things just a little bit differently. And you'll see it here in this passage because there is, there is the beginning of references to Gentiles for the first time. It's not complete, it's not full blown, it's not I'm going to the Gentiles, it's not the rejection of the Jews that turns him to the Gentiles. But there are Gentiles involved in this passage this morning, and that's, and that's very key as, as you take a look at it. So you see the passage on the screen, Mark 7, 24 to 8, 10, and I want to read down here uh, verses 24 to 30, and, and come on in, there's places up front here too. Um, verses 24 to 30 is, as, as we begin this passage. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So let's take a look at a map here. So you'll notice on the map, I've got, I've got several things on this map but, that I want to point out. First of all, most of his ministry is occurring here around the Sea of Galilee, around really on this side of the Sea of Galilee and around the top. So Capernaum is up here at the top, Bethsaida is up here at the top, Nazareth of course is over here, uh, away from the Sea of Galilee, up in the, up in the hills. But, but most of it is occurring around this side of the Sea of Galilee. Why? Why? They didn't like him in Jerusalem. Didn't like him in Jerusalem, that's for sure. He stayed away from Jerusalem. So the Pharisees would come, would come up to, to the Sea of Galilee, up, up to Galilee to question him. Well, it's kind of like, who, who was Willie, Willie, who was the bank robber that says, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Well, that's where the people are. I mean, that's, that's why he was doing his ministry, because the Jewish population surrounded over here on this side and across the top. But you got over onto this side, over on the west side, <clears throat> excuse me, the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and that's where you found the demon-possessed man, um, and, 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 you found, and you find Gentiles down over here in this area, and you find Gentiles up along the Mediterranean Sea, Tyre, and above, and above Tyre is Sidon. So what we see him doing now is we see him leaving the Sea of Galilee and going up to the area of Tyre and Sidon. And this is where he runs into the Syrophoenician woman. Now Syrophoenicia is just a long term that means that area up there, Phoenicia, and, and, and Syro as in Syria over here. So Syrophoenician is that area up, up above. Gentile woman. So that's very important because when we ask our first question here, he responds, Jesus responds to the Syrophoenician woman's question with a mini parable about children, bread, and dogs. What's, what is he saying? Children, bread, and dogs. Terry. Yeah, the Jews come first as far as his ministry is concerned, and then the Gentiles. Okay, the Jews come first and then the Gentiles. So, so the, the, Jews, the, the Jews 
had a corner on God. I mean, the gospel was coming to the Jews. And the Gentiles were hearing about this. They were hearing about the healings. They were hearing about the miracles. It was traveling as trade went up these roads and, 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 and commerce occurred. The story was going out. And, and so they were hearing about it and they were saying, well, this Syrophoenician woman approaches Jesus and says, I've got, I've got this daughter that needs to be healed of this demon. Will you do that? Pretty rough response, don't you think? Ken? I'd like to suggest that he was speaking to the Jews and saying, I'm not going to take your God away from you in order to help the Gentiles. I'm not going to take the food away from my children and throw it to the dogs. So that they would feel it's not taking something away. Well. But then they learn that it's giving something that can be freely given to everyone. Okay, so to the Jews that were listening to that message, and there would have been a few in, the, in his presence, but to the Jews that were listening to that message, they would have realized that they were the children and that, and that, and that they, it wasn't being taken away from them, but in this particular case was being shared with others. Okay? What else, what else do you see here? Is that a little rough? He called her a dog. Sorry. He called her a dog. He did. He did. John? Dogs in that day were not treated like dogs. No. No, they they are not. This was not this was not a nice reference. Now, I mean there are some people that 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 uh, take a look at that passage and they make a distinction on the word that was used there, so it was like Little dog. I don't know if that means like Chihuahua or, but I mean it was little dog versus versus big dog or, no, oh, that's a little less offensive to call somebody a little dog, versus a big dog. Maybe, maybe still a dog, still a dog. Yeah, Sally. Yeah. The, <clears throat> right. And how they just, you know, it's, like that they throw it, it on the ground, you know? Yeah. Food spills off yeah. the table. Yeah. Sometimes they feed the dog. They slip it under <laughs> the, slip it under the high chair and yeah. dog standing there. Yeah. Strong, Good place. Strong suggests puppy dog. Puppy dog. Yeah. That's the little, that's the little dog. Tip? It's, in looking at this whole situation, I, 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 I said, those, those look like in our culture, to do that would have been pretty harsh. Yeah. We look at it as pretty harsh. Yeah. But when you look at what Jesus' ministry was, he first came to the Jews who were people who had the background to be able to understand who he was okay. and what his mission was. Okay. This Syrophoenician woman really didn't understand any of the background of that. She right. just knew, I need something. Right, that, that is true. So he came to the Jews, he came to the Jews who had the background to understand. They understood there was one God. They understood who that God is. They did not understand that he was the son of God, but had that background. The Syrophoenician woman did not have that background. Lonnie? Maybe he didn't benefit of the woman, asking the woman, what is your relationship with me? Well, yes, it was a test of the woman as well, which she responded to. The parallel passage, is, is found in Matthew. And Matthew 15 reads this, Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. Well, there were a lot of people crying out after Christ around the Sea of Galilee. Anyway, interesting. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. 
And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So there's the parallel passage, gives you a little more of the conversation that was happening at that time. And this phrase in here, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, is instructional for us that, that it was Christ, Christ was sent to the Jews. Now we, of course, have, we have the hindsight. We have, we have the rearview mirror and we can see all that, that unfolded where he was then, where then he went to the Gentiles. But his initial ministry was to the lost sheep of Israel. And you read this in, 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 in other passages. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. These 12 Jesus sent out instructing them. This was early again, Matthew 10, right ahead of that 11 passage. These 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And one more, this is in Acts now, after, of course, Christ's ministry. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So I think that's what our understanding needs to be about that passage about the dogs and the children and the crumbs and all of this, was that, was that you know, Christ's ministry was to the Jews when he came. The Jews rejected and he turned, and the apostles turned, and his ministry changed as he then went to the Gentiles. But even the disciples' response of send that woman away gives you a little indication of where their mindset was as it related to the Gentiles or the Greeks. I mean, it was really the Jews and the Greeks, even though they weren't really Greek, it was just understood that was, that's just another, another phrase for the Gentiles. Ken? So if the Jews had accepted him, Oh. Would we have to become Jewish today to be yeah, what yeah, what if what if what if what if the Jews had accepted what if they had would, would yeah, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Can't answer that question. So so then the 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 woman responds, what evidence is there that the woman has understood Jesus' point of view? His point. What evidence do you see there? She, she, she did not disagree that she was a dog. Isn't that interesting? She didn't say, oh, I'm offended. <laughs> I think I'll sue you. Yes? Well, back in that passage in Matthew, she knew who he was. She said, oh, Lord, someday. Yeah, yeah. She knew who he was. She knew who, she knew who he was. Yeah, but didn't disagree that she was a dog. Oh, is that right? The only time in the Gospel of Mark where he was addressed at personally as Lord. That's true. Think of all the opportunities he had for the Gentiles, the Jews, to respond and say, Lord. Oh, sure. And they did not. They did not respond in the same way. Yeah. Peggy? So then when he says for this statement, like, he's pointing toward her humility. Her, her, her humility. Like yeah. Accepting her place as being yeah. needy and. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and this is where, this isn't on your sheet, but this was the, this was the question, this is the follow-up question. In what way is our salvation experience similar to her experience with Christ? Right? Admit we're a sinner. What's that? Admit we're the sinner. We're the sinner. We, you know, are we deserving of salvation any more than a dog is deserving of being fed? No. You know, you see, you, you see that, that attitude, of, that attitude of, hum, of humility. And do, do any of us have a right to expect anything from God? Jim. Well, I think that's a key point because the Jews, because they were Jews, and the others would consider Gentile gods, so forth, they felt they did deserve. The Jews felt they deserved. And so they felt, well, this is, this is supposed to be our thing. Right. You know? And they figured it would be a different way. Uh-huh. 
not the, his way, obviously, but they thought it was deserved. Because yeah. They were born. They were the chosen ones. They, they, they deserved this. They missed the point, right? Tip? There was a, the attitude of the woman here was that even though she recognized that she was not a Jew, right. she also recognized who, I, mean, I don't know if she totally understood who Jesus was, but she did know that what he had to offer, she wanted. Right. What he had to offer, she wanted. She knew that much. And, and she declared him to be Lord, son of, son of David. I mean, she, she declared that. But she knew what she wanted. She knew what she needed from him. And his response of, for this statement, and what, what's that? The words that she used? Probably not. The attitude of her heart? Probably so. An attitude of faith? I, 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 I am turning to you to give this to me. I cannot, I cannot do this. I need you. I need you. And you, only you, can give this to me. So, you know, is, do we have the right to expect anything from God? Do we have the right to expect salvation? Do we have the right, do we have the right to expect? Let's just a answer that question. Do we have the right to expect anything from God? <laughs> John. Well, it depends on what you call faith. De depends on what? You're calling the expectations of faith. Faith? Sure. Okay. As we express faith? Okay. Jim? Well, from the aspect of the law, <clears throat> no. Okay. He said, you're done, you know, you're out of here, I'm changing everything, and you've got to toil and work and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, so from the aspect of the fall, no. From the aspect of the fall, man turns his back on God, his, her, back on God, and rejects God. What is God's obligation at that point? Does he have a moral obligation? Does he have a legal obligation? Is there anything that would obligate God to now respond by providing salvation? Do we have anything to expect? So from that perspective, no. What else, Dave? Okay. With that promise of mind, I think we can absolutely expect it. And that's, that's the aspect okay. of assurance. Because I think expectation and confidence. Okay. He gave a promise. So in response to the promise, his initiating, his pursuing, his providing, he then gives us a promise that if you respond in faith, I will give. I will give. As this woman says, I just need crumbs. Crumbs. That's that's all I need. Larry. I think it's important to understand that this promise is on the God's terms. In other words, we still I think we struggle even in our society to look at the God we want rather than the God we live. Sure. And we expect God to respond to us on our terms. Sure. When, when you know that's when we are yep. rightful. That's when we are wrong. We respond to Him when it becomes our expectation that He responds to us. We got it wrong. We've got it backwards. Peggy? You can expect him to be God. Okay. Because he has characteristics. That's right. And he's going to always be those things. Right. We can expect him to be God, which includes being loving, which includes being just. Right? Deb? We can also expect that once we're his children, that he will never leave us. Yep. He is because of his promise, he will never leave us. We can expect that. We can count on that. I saw another hand over here. Terry? Well, back in, after the fall, we would expect the son to come. I mean, there was a promise even back there that right. we were not left destitute. He did not leave us weak. Right. You know, even then, there was an expectation. So he gave us expectations as a result of his promises. But, but us standing before God and saying, I deserve this? Well... Careful what you ask for, uh, because deserve may be justice, right, for our sin. 
but because of his promises, we can expect forgiveness if we do according to his word. I mean, if we respond in faith, if we, if, if we place our faith in that promise, in, in him. You know, so here's this woman, here's this woman who in a very, very simple act of faith, very simple act of faith, is, 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 is having the same attitude that we have when in, in our salvation experience and hopefully in our entire walk with God. Ken. As we're studying in Hebrews in our men's Bible study, God created a new covenant with Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah, and that new covenant then is is what is what gives us that security. So you know, so you know, you look here and you say, boy, this was a long time ago, and 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 it almost looks like he insults her, but but it's it's the truth. To some degree, it's it's the truth that he was speaking to her. Lonnie. Um, yeah, and according to Matthew passage, you know, he does. She, she calls him son of David, which would be a messianic term. Yeah. So she, a gentile, is admitting that he's the Messiah. Yeah. Jews. Yeah. And of course, in this context, he's defending that he is to the Jews. So I think he's asking her, okay, so what do you, yeah. what's your relationship with me? Yeah. And she's trusting that she can benefit from his power as well. And he rewards that by saying, you're, you're right. It, I mean, it was a clear expression of faith. You know, he asks. And she responds in she responds in faith. It's a it's it's a great it's a great illustration. Well, let's go on now um, to the next the next part here where he heals a deaf man. Verse thirty one. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the, to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. Okay, I'm going to go back to the map here for a second because I want to show you where we are. This is Decapolis. There were ten there were ten cities. They're marked in black here. 10 kind of city states, and, and that was Decapolis, right? 10 of them. 10 cities, and they were all over here on this side, including Damascus up on top. So he now has come from Tyre and Sidon. He has come past the Sea of Galilee, and he's down in this area somewhere. We don't know exactly where he is, but he went into the area of Decapolis. More Gentiles. This is where the, this is where the Gentiles lived. And, and, so, and so over in here now, now you got to ask yourself, so why is he doing this? Why is he, why is he going up to Tyre and Sidon and then he's running over to Decapolis and, and, his, and, and the people are looking for him around the Sea of Galilee? You know, and, and lots of, I mean, it doesn't say, start there, it doesn't say. A lot of people believe that this business, and you'll see it here, this business of don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, you know, shh, shh don't tell anybody was an attempt to slow down that process of taking him to the cross. And, and the Pharisees were trying to catch him and, and everybody was, everybody, everybody from Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders were after him. And so he went up to Tyre and Sidon to get away from that. He's over in Decapolis to get away from that. But of course, he heals the, the, the demon-possessed girl up in Tyre and Sidon. He's now gonna heal a deaf man down in Decapolis, and he's about to feed 4,000 people. So, shh, shh, don't tell anybody, it isn't working so well. Um, it, 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 the word is getting out, even amongst, even amongst the Gentiles over on, that, over on that side. So, now let's get back to the, to the, deaf, the deaf man. Um, he returned, he returned from, the Tyre of, from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the, in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Aphatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Um, so, what is the significance of these mir miracles taking place in the Gentile population? So, this, this phrase here, makes the deaf hear and the mute speak, is not a... Uh, just an interesting phrase. It is. It is. It, it appears to be directly related to prophecy, and and 
Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then, the, then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy, for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The Messiah. The Messiah, the Messiah has come. And, and so, so now we are seeing that this prophecy is actually finding fulfillment outside of the Jewish population. It's not just the Jews. But we're in Decapolis with a Gentile population and the deaf can hear and the mute can speak. And, and it's beginning to open our understanding of this gospel is, is much broader than simply the nation of Israel. And we're seeing, and we're seeing some of the fulfillment here. Um, Matthew 11, 4 through 6, Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Go tell John, You're, you are correct. I am the Messiah. I am fulfilling this prophecy, this messianic prophecy from Isaiah. I am the Messiah. One other thing, though, that is significant, I think, and that is that it's not just a fulfillment of physical healing of deafness, but rather it's spiritual. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. So it was, it was the physical healing of deafness and blindness, but it was also that spiritual aspect of the deaf now can hear the word, the blind can see, People can understand uh, the messianic message. Yes. I think one of the things that's significant is that when you're dealing with, you know, let's say some of the exclusivity of the Jews, well, God's initial promise to Abraham was, was that his people would be a blessing to all people. Right. And so all the nations all of the world the will be blessed. Will be blessed through them. Right. So yep. isn't Jesus fulfilling that it's, it's, it is that fulfillment as well. Through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Yeah. So, again, the deafness, I, I have to tell you, you know, my, um, of course, I work, at a, I work at a hospital that works with deaf children. And, and um, my, my predecessor, and, and he's passed away now, but I remember him talking about this passage of Scripture. And he had all the scientific explanation of what this really was, and it was not a miraculous healing. I don't think it was a cochlear implant. I don't see any... I don't see any hearing aids, um, but he, he had explained it away, unfortunately. So, moving on, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 8. In those days, so we're in the same period of time here in the Decapolis. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now these days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. His disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. He directed the crowd to sit, on, to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. They took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the districts of Dalmuth, Dalmanthu, Dalmanutha, straight across the Sea of Galilee over to the city of Magda, where Mary Magdalene came from straight across the Sea of Galilee. So now he's moving over to the west side, back to, back to Galilee again. Okay, remind you of another story. Just change the numbers, right? 4,000, 5,000. So 5,000 5, was, was, was here. So why do you suppose the disciples, having witnessed the feeding of the 5,000, and that's in chapter 6, I think on your sheet it says 5, chapter 6, 30 to 44, have such a hard time believing Jesus can supply the need of 4,000? What's, is, do you see any difference between the 5,000 and the 4,000? I think, yeah, I know we blame it on the disciples' faith, but I'm wondering, 
Is it because they didn't think he would do it for Gentiles? I wonder. Yeah. Is it because they were saying these people, and there's some discussion of, as to that phrase, these people, Greek, Greeks, Gentiles, uh, you know, are you going to feed them too? And maybe that, that could be one of the things that stumped them. You know, these people, could he be referring to Gentiles? Ken? A one-time miracle doesn't build faith. A one-time miracle doesn't build faith. Well, good, good point. We're going to talk about that. that uh, Tip? That verse, and his disciples responded, where will anyone be able to find enough bread? Right. Well, as I thought about that myself, he says, you know what? This is out of my control. I, I can't do this. I mean, this right? is what they're saying. I can't do this. So that's probably, a, if I can't do it, who can? Right. 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 If it's if I can't do it, who can? Uh, Four thousand people is a lot to feed. I mean, if you go to the if you go to the you know the Assure banquet, um, you know, a few weeks ago at the La Vista Embassy had fifteen hundred at the tables. That's a lot of people. Now times three, you know, four four thousand people sitting in that room. That's a lot. I think also as he builds. His Yes, he was getting away from the Pharisees from Jerusalem, but he's also making a free man because those guys are going, how is he messing our people up? He's going around messing everybody else up. Yeah. And who does he think he is? Stir, stirring up the region. Yeah. And, and who, does, who does he think he is? <laughs> he knows. Yeah. He knows who he is. Um, so, so on the one hand, you see here, having just experienced the feeding of the 5,000, and you're right, you, you, you turn to the disciples and you say, what's wrong with you? You, you saw 5,000 being fed. 4,000 is actually easier. You know, so, so, so why, why, do you lack, why do you lack faith? Having seen 5,000, isn't 4,000 easier? Yeah, because when have you acted similarly? <laughs> Not expecting God to work just after he has met a need in your life. When I lack faith. When I lack faith. Okay. Yeah. I mean, how much evidence, how much evidence do we need? Just a little bit more. Yeah. A little bit more. I liken it to that sinking feeling when we were in school, when you walked into the class and said, this might be it. This, this is the one where I studied all the wrong material, where I, you know, I don't care if I've done well, this one might be it. Maybe this is the one where he doesn't. Maybe this is the one where I have to. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is it. How do we ever get past that? Or am I just talking for myself here? No? Okay, thank you. How do we ever get past that? Peggy? Isn't there an example of this in the Old Testament where they used stones or something or markers as reminders so that they were reminded of what they were doing? Yep. And in the same way, I mean, we could use something, you know, even instead of journal or something. Mm -hmm. When they, crossed into the, when they crossed into the Promised Land and crossed the Jordan, he, they took 12 stones and they piled it up. And they said, this is a marker. Remember this. Remember. This is a marker. God didn't, God didn't part the Jordan every day. He didn't do it every time they came down to the Jordan. But he did at that time. Remember. Re remember that. So practical things. A journal. A list of those things that God has done in your life. And, and if you've ever had the experience, maybe at a seminar or something, where you kind of do a lifeline, and, and, you, and you, you, take, you take a look at however many years you've, you've lived, and you look back and you say, oh yeah, there he was, there he was, there he was. 
And, and, and we have those markers in our lives where we say, oh, I have no doubt God intervened. God intervened. He, he saved me in this situation. I cried out to him and he saved me as we, as we experienced being saved. Right, Peggy? Uh, I actually have, um, when prayer ministry diary was notation from decades, I mean, raising kids and military life and death of loved ones, whatever, where, and, and even the people I still keep in contact with, the ones that, we, that I was in those small groups with. And we can go back and look and say, yeah, remember when we prayed about this? And yeah. when he did this for you know, he did this. And remember when he answered this prayer? Remember when he brought you through that? And, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's right there in black and white. Not that I would necessarily forget all, you know, all of them or some of them or whatever, but it is pretty amazing to, even when I communicate with people I was in prayer groups with, yeah. you know, they'll bring up things that are going on in their life now. And they'll say, yeah, remember when, you know, when we prayed for my daughter, Kelly, when she was mm-hmm. going through this thing? And right. now, you know, she has three kids, and look what he's brought her through, you know, whatever. And it's, it's just that, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. It's remember. So, it's encouraging. Oh. It's so encouraging. Sure. From prayer journals. Yes. To, re- to remember. Yeah. Remember. Oh, we didn't just write down the request. Right. We would go back and write down the answers. Yeah. We're not starting over every day. It doesn't, it's not Groundhog Day. I mean, we don't, we don't start over with God every day, but we don't always remember. But remember as in prayer journals, but remember as in his promises. I forget those. I mean, sometimes I read a passage of scripture, and I say, I don't think I've ever read this. I've read that. I have forgotten. And so, again, if you're not... I mean, if you're not in the Word, if you're not, if, if you're not causing your memory to be reminded, then again, you're, it's easy to just veer off. It's easy to forget. It's easy to, it's easy to imagine that you're starting over every day. That's a tough way to live, to not have anything of the past helping you in this. And anything of his word or, or your own experience with God. It's a very, it's a very practical thing. And here's the disciples <clears throat> having experienced 5,000 being fed. Now he's about to do almost exactly the same thing with the 4,000. And it's like all new. It's like starting over. Now some of that I think is because they didn't yet quite grasp who he is. They knew that he did the miracle, but they didn't necessarily know that that, and and as a matter of fact, it's about to come to the Peter, who do you say that I am? He's coming up on that. Who who am I? And, And so all of this is leading to that call. You know, who am I? But, but at this point, they're still, they're still processing. They're still understanding that. You know, how do we get past this? It's like, oh, wow, I'm so surprised. And, um, or, oh, wow, I'm so anxious because we've forgotten. We have forgotten his word. We have forgotten our experiences with him. And that, that reminding is, is, I think, very important as we, as we walk. One last question. The details in Mark's account stress, what details in Mark's account stress the adequacy of Jesus' ability to meet the people's needs? Two things came out to me in this question. One was that when, when it all started, he makes a statement. He says, when a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he looked, so he's looking at their need and saying, you know, they've come from so far away and if I send them away at this point, they're gonna faint on the way home. They need something, they need something to eat. And what does he say? I have compassion on the crowd. So when it, when it comes to meeting needs, I think, that, I think that the first thing, you know, the adequacy of his ability is, is who he is, his compassion. He's, he looks upon us and sees our need and responds in compassion. That is, he, that's who he is. He could have said, be warm, be filled, be gone, and off you go. I, you know, God bless you. 
send you away, but rather he, he responded in compassion. And then the other thing is here, he multiplied resources. He took what was there and multiplied resources. And, you know, honestly, I think that we're, we're facing that as a congregation. I think, that we're, I think that we're looking at what is always the case, limited resources. We wish we had more. We wish we had more, we could do more. We wish that, we wish that it was bigger, we wish it was better, we wish it was brighter, shinier, whatever. And, and, and we say, but, but here, God, here is what, I mean, we are offering you what is here. We are offering you what we have. Please multiply it. Take the seven loaves, take the three fishes, and, and multiply it. And he does. And that's, and that's the faith that we need. In, in to, that, that's the faith that we need as we, as we hand him the resources that we have in our lives and as a congregation. Sometimes the struggle is the difference between presumption, you know, expecting God to do a miracle all the time, mm -hmm. and the faith. I think a significant factor is when Jesus tells you to do it. Yes. You know, Jesus said, okay, we need to feed these people. Yes. Then I think, it's, then I think we should expect Jesus yes. to have your faith to work. Okay, excellent. So when he says it, go feed these people. When he says to us, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. How do we respond in faith? Okay, not sure how to do that, but okay. Abraham, go and I'll show you. Okay, so what are we to do? We are to respond in obedience. That's what we're to do. We're, we're to respond in faith. He has asked me to do this and I have seven loaves. That's what I've got. I got seven loaves. Will he do that? Well, he's asked me to do it. And we respond in faith. That's what we're about. Okay, let's close in prayer. Father, we, we, uh, we learn so much as we go through your word because you are, you are alive. Your word is alive. Your Holy Spirit is here. You are teaching us as we go through. But Father, we want to be doers of your word, not just hearers. We want it to change us. We want to go from here and we want to respond differently as a result. We want to express our faith more clearly. We want to respond to your calling more clearly, and we ask that you enable us to do that. We ask this in your name. Amen.